Well, I'm d delighted to be here, and I'm glad I have the opportunity to share some of our work with you and then to learn more about what all of you are doing later uh, this afternoon. What I tried to do is hit some of the high points that I think people should be aware of and thinking about if you're thinking about whether or not this approach to outcome measurement might be relevant to the work that you're doing. So that's kind of the approach that I'll take as a jumping off point. Feel free to jump in if you have questions or comments as, as I go through. Um, so I just want to talk I'll just a very little bit about measurement, but in particular I want to contrast classical approaches which is how I was trained in measurement with IRT-based approaches, which are pretty much all that uh, we use now in our group today, to give you a sense of the pros and the cons, the two different approaches, and then just hit some of the highlights about IRT. And then having done that, I'll introduce computer adaptive techniques, or CAT techniques, and um, talk about the relationship of the two. And then I'm going to give you an example of some work that we're currently doing with the Social Security Administration. And if you've never had the pleasure of working with the Social Security Administration, <laughs> I could spend the rest of the, you have? Oh, <laughs> I could spend the rest of the day talking about some of the anecdotes of working with that organization. You know, I've worked with CMS over the years and I thought it could not get worse. I've worked with the VA and I thought it's no way it could ever get worse. And then I started working with the Social Security Administration and it's just has been eye-opening. And then I just want to talk a little bit about the Boston Rehabilitation Outcomes Measurement Center, or the Boston ROC, give a plug uh, to that. And I appreciate your mentioning that, John. And um, John was very generous to uh, agree to be on our advisory board, which I know was no easy thing to do, because if you don't get refunded in your competition, the last thing you want to do is stay connected to that uh, ongoing uh, endeavor. And I, I've been there, and so I appreciate your willingness to do that so we could learn from your uh, experience and expertise. But uh, it is a resource that is available to the research community, so I think it's something that you might be interested in, and there might be ways in which you could interact with us at Boston. So that's particularly why I'm pleased to be here, because I see some real potential for ongoing collaboration. So, and quantitative measurement. My focus will be on quantitative, not qualitative measurement. So that's important to understand because pretty much the principles of IRT and CAT only apply when it's quantitative measurement that you're after and not when you're looking at nominal approaches to measurement. That's a whole different other topic. So it requires that we have an underlying concept that we're trying to measure and we want to express something about that trait in terms of more or less the quantitative aspects. And so in looking at uh, the kinds of tests and measures that we use, we're always trying to put together operational definitions using various types of test items, putting them together in some form of combination that will help us reflect that underlying concept or trait. That's what we're all about. So item analysis, which is what we spend a lot of our time doing, it's a way of um, understanding and measuring the, the quality of the questions that we come up with for the various tests and measures that we develop. And I've, I've, some of you shared with me some of the stuff that you're doing in the area of test and measurement. So the principles are exactly the same in terms of what you're trying to do. The approach to getting at it is what is a little different. So it was helpful for me to see uh, what, what you were doing. So you want to know how well these items measure the underlying trait, whether you're using classical techniques or item response theory techniques. So from a classical test approach, um, it, you know, th these are psychometric procedures and principles that have been used for decades. And as I said, that's, that's how I was trained. And you develop a fixed set of items and you put it into some um, entity, you call it an outcome instrument or whatever, but it's basically um, a questionnaire or an instrument or a test, and you present that to either a patient or you present it to a clinician if it's clinician-based or some combination thereof. The principles are the same, whether the data comes from the patient or the clinician or some other source. 
and you present in a classical test approach, you present all the items. You can't select certain ones. If you put together a hundred items in a test, you gotta present the hundred items. And then you score, somehow you sum the scores, and there are different ways that you do it across all the items in the instrument, and you develop a, a score for that individual. And then the, uh, the true score, observed scores, represent true score and error. And obviously we're always trying to damp down the amount of error, maximize the amount of uh, true score so we really understand what's going on. And there's all kinds of psychometric um, tests that we use to basically explain how well we did. So I'll give you an example here from my background uh, as a physical therapist. It's the Ask Westry Disability Questionnaire. This is Joe, physical therapist, working with a low back patient. Um, <laughs> my apologies if this is offensive. <laughs> the first time I presented this to the American Physical Therapy Association some years ago, and oh, they were so offended. <laughs> they have no sense of humor. <laughs> I, couldn't, I, could, I thought, when I saw this, I thought, wow, this is really great. I don't know if you're familiar with the Oswestry, but it's not important at all to the story that I'm trying to tell. It covers 10 different areas that are relevant to someone who has low back pain from a functional point of view. And in each area, there are different categories. And someone is presented, say, with pain intensity, and then you try to select the best choice. I have no pain. The pain is very mild and so forth. And so these are the 10 areas. And so for scoring, um, the total possible score in each of those 10 sections is 5. And then the first statement is marked as a 0. The last statement is marked as a 5, so it goes from 0 to 5. And you do that across the 10 sections, and then you calculate a score. You add up the number of points. You divide it by the total. In this case, it's 50. And then you multiply by 100, and you get a percent. Pretty standard approach that's used in classical test theory. Now, item response theory, in contrast, it examines a person's likely response to a particular item on a particular instrument. And it, it examines an individual's and predicts an individual's response based on the ability of that person on the underlying trait, and then based on the established characteristics of each of those items in the test. And in IRT lingo, there are different parameters on which one can evaluate test items. And the, the simplest is just to look at the difficulty of the, of the item. And that's, in the health field, mostly what people have focused on, just one, what they call one-parameter IRT models that focus on the difficulty of the items. But increasingly, particularly in education, items can be uh, differentiated on other parameters, other dimensions that give you a... Um, a more nuanced understanding of the underlying trait. So it can get much more sophisticated. And I'm going to keep it very simple for this discussion, but you should be aware when you read in the literature, and we're seeing it now in rehab, two parameter models, three parameter models, they're looking at different characteristics of the items beyond their difficulty on a continuum of the underlying trait. So in, in classic IRT, in addition to difficulty, you could look at how well an item discriminates between people in different regions of the underlying trait. Or in education, they're particularly interested in this. In a three-dimensional model, they might be looking at whether or not people are guessing at particular items. Because if all of us guessed on, on you know, tests that we have taken. And in some of the work that we do in rehab, guessing is a can be a relevant issue as well when people might give um, particular patterns of responses. So that's just by way of, of background. Now IRT, like all statistical techniques, has certain assumptions underlying it. One of it is that the trait you're trying to measure is unidimensional. So that's really important. And we do a lot of work trying to figure out the dimensions that we're trying to get at. We, we use the um, ICF a great deal as our starting point for looking at dimensionality of our underlying traits. And I don't know if you're familiar and work with the ICF. 
It's the International Classification of Function, Disability, and Health. And if you're not, I saw that we have a copy of uh, our IOM report, but it's discussed in there, and you can look it up at the World Health Organization if you're not familiar with it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> For a price. <laughs> so unidimensionality is uh, really important, which doesn't mean that all uh, uh, traits that we're interested in are one-dimensional. It may mean that you end up with multiple sub-traits that you try to then develop scales to assess. That's typically what happens in our work. We, we find multiple traits. And we also find that the uh, hypothesized traits put forth in the ICF don't hold up frequently as well. So we use it as a starting point, and then we, we go from there. Um, the items have to be independent, which means they're not related, except that they're designed to measure that same underlying trait. And you have to, when you put together these uh, tests, you have to show good fit of the data to the model. And so that the response that a person gives can be modeled appropriately by a mathematical uh, function. It's called the IRF function. And it, it establishes, it assumes, and then establishes an arbitrary scale, a quantitative scale. And it moves the measurement out of the ordinal range where many of our uh, classical tests began to a more interval level scale. And so it allows us to do more sophisticated mathematical manipulations with the scores, which is incredibly useful. And we no longer have to pretend that they're interval scale scores, which is what traditionally we have all done. The Oswestry is a perfect example. That's an ordinal scale, but look, I showed you how it's scored. That's assuming that it's, in fact, an interval scale, which it really isn't. So this al allows us to actually develop true interval level scales. So those are some of the assumptions. So the basic formula, what you're looking at is the probability that a person will respond yes to a particular item I for a person N with a given trait. And then it's a function of a constant, a person's given level of the trait, and the difficulty. This is a one parameter model of a dichotomous um, variable. So it, it takes into account the, the difficulty, the person's level on that trait, and a constant in this basic formula. And if you get into other more sophisticated uh, IRT models, the, the formulae develop from there. But it all tracks from this basic formula.